The purpose of this recorded lecture is to begin a discussion of the design phase of the ABBY model. Primarily, we will focus on the organizational aspects of instructional strategies by examining the events of instruction as outlined by Smith and Reagan and the key differences in generative and supplantive approaches to instruction. Listed on this page are the learning outcomes for this unit. Please pause the recording to view them. Instructional strategies have three aspects, management strategy characteristics, delivery strategy characteristics, and organizational strategy characteristics. Management strategy characteristics are things like scheduling and allocation of resources to implement instruction. Think about your course. What will the scheduling look like? Will it be during one or two professional development meetings, a seminar scheduled over five consecutive days, or a semesterly long course with several units. The second aspect is the delivery strategy characteristics of an instructional strategy. When considering these characteristics, you will identify the instructional medium to be used and how learners are grouped during instruction. Lastly, organizational strategy characteristics are considered. Decisions are made about how instruction is sequenced, what content is presented, and how content is presented. This is the aspect that will be the focus for this recorded lecture. On the next two slides, you will practice identifying which aspect is being addressed. Lesson level design usually focuses on organizational strategy decisions. It is important to note that lessons organized with an introduction, body, conclusion, and assessment have been found to facilitate learning, regardless of the objective. Smith and Reagan discuss 15 events of instruction, each of which fall into one of these four categories. On the next several slides, we will take a look at these events. Smith and Reagan state the introduction of a lesson includes the following events. Introduction, activate attention, establish purpose, arouse interest and motivation, and preview learning activity. The introduction prepares learners for the lesson or learning experience. It promotes selective attention and brings relevant memories to working memory, which can be useful in making new knowledge understandable. It also establishes an expectancy for a learning goal. When activating attention, learners focus their attention on the learning task. The major concern here is including enough stimulation to draw attention to the learning task, but not so much that the learner's attention is directed only on the attention-directing device and distracted from the learning task. We want to be careful not to increase extraneous load here. When establishing purpose, telling students what they are about to learn may facilitate learning if the goals for the learning have been determined. However, learners may be able to establish their own purpose for learning. This event establishes expectancy for learners, raises interest, and gives them a goal to which, at which to direct their mental energy. It may summon information from long-term memory that might be applicable to the task and can be combined with activating attention. When arousing interest and motivation, learners are made cognizant of the importance and relevance of the lesson or are encouraged to explore the personal relevance of the lesson. If engaging in the lesson is voluntary, learners may have already determined personal relevancy. If it is mandatory, then it is important to establish the importance of the goal. One way to do this is to discuss the benefits of and the risks avoided by mastering the new information. Lastly, when previewing the learning activity, Instruction may summarize the procedure or process that will be used in the lesson. Learners engaged in experiential learning will benefit from knowing what they are doing before they begin. The body of the lesson includes the following events, recall of relevant prior knowledge, process information and examples, and focus attention. When recalling relevant prior knowledge, learners are stimulated to retrieve knowledge from long-term memory that is necessary or helpful in learning the new objective, as well as cognitive strategies that will be used to learn the new information. 
During this event, a comparative advanced organizer provides a framework or schema for new learning by comparing a similar known entity to it. Analogies could also compare known concepts to concepts to be learned. An expository review is a simple way to summarize or restate relevant prior knowledge that learners already know. During this event, we want to avoid negative transfer or the application of inappropriate or inaccurate prior knowledge to the current context or lesson. When processing information and examples, learners encounter the material they are learning. This can be done in an expository sequence or discovery sequence. In an expository sequence, learners are presented with a definition of a concept and examples or non-examples of the concept. In this sequence, declarative knowledge is stated or read. In a discovery sequence, learners are presented with examples and are prompted to induce the concept, which requires learners to do more cognitive processing with less support. When focusing attention, the instructional design the instructional designer decides how to continually reinforce attention during the lesson. The fourth event in the body is to employ learning strategies or assist learners in using learning strategies that will be effective for the learning outcome type being addressed. This may be challenging because most learning strategies are cognitive and internal. Thus, an instructor will likely not be able to assess if learning strategy was used. So designers embed more scaffolded or supplanted instruction to ensure learners are getting the assistance they need. During the practice event, learners have the opportunity to interact with the material being learned. The purpose is to see how learning is progressing and provides the opportunity to use remediation if needed. Allowing learners to practice across the range of content with which they should be skilled and across the range of difficulty is critical to this event as it promotes automaticity or skilled performance. Practice can vary by learning type. For example, if the learning outcome type is declarative knowledge, then learners can state, summarize, recognize, or list information they are learning. However, these strategies are not appropriate for a psychomotor or problem-solving outcome. Practice must be relevant, authentic to the learners and their context, and anchored in familiar situations. Designers commonly design practice that catches where learners go wrong in order to provide correction and address common misconceptions. When evaluating or providing feedback, learners are given the opportunity to consider information about the appropriateness of their responses during practice. Feedback is formative and can be constructed so learners can induce their progress from the consequences of their actions. Learners may also require a higher level of scaffolding or instructional support to evaluate their feedback. The challenge here is that instructors may be unable to give tailored feedback to learners in a class after each practice response. The conclusion of a lesson allows learners to review and elaborate on recent learning to use in further application. It supports synthesis of material covered and the consolidation of new learning. The conclusion of the lesson includes the following events, summarize and review, transfer learning, and remotivate and close. Summarize and review ensures the learners recall and synthesize the critical parts of the lesson into a memorable and applicable whole. It reminds learners of what was just learned and restates the gist of the lesson. The content varies depending on type of learning outcome, and both declarative knowledge and psychomotor skills seem to require the most review. Spaced out practice of new learning seems to facilitate retention and recall. During the transfer learning event, the designer can enhance transfer by giving learners opportunities to apply their learning to various circumstances. This is critical for learning concepts, principles, procedures, problem solving, cognitive strategies, psychomotor skills, and attitudes. The goal of this event is to enable learners to generalize new learning to situations where it is appropriate and it encourages learners to create rules of thumb to determine when new learning is appropriate. Transfer does not happen automatically, and learners may need to be prompted to see the connections between prior learning and the new situation. When remotivating learners and closing the lesson, it is important to note that learner attitude toward learning and new content influences how well the learning is acquired and how well learning will be retained. 
Designers should encourage learners to assess how new learning can be applied immediately. Closure lets learners know that the lesson is over and allows the instructor to end the lesson on a positive note. The assessment of the lesson includes the following events. Assess learning and evaluate feedback and seek remediation. When assessing learning, designers should assess whether learners achieve the goal or goals of instruction and use this information to refine instruction. Instructors should use assessment to guide remediation. Since the lesson has already come to a close, decisions made based on this event are more summative than formative. In the final event, learners receive cumulative feedback based on the assessment. Remediation may also be provided to address specific goals or learning strategies that learners did not use. As an instructional designer, you will carefully design instruction based on the learner, context, and task analyses conducted in the analysis phase of the ADDIE model. As you strategize how to approach lessons in your course, you will need to make critical decisions about the level of support or scaffolding your target audience will receive as they learn the new information presented. Instructional support may be supplied by the instruction, supplied by the instructor, or shared between the learner and the instructor. When learning or cognitive processing is highly supported by the instruction or instructor, then instruction is more supplanted. This is in opposition to lessons where the cognitive processing is generated by the learners, and thus the instruction is said to be more generative. When making decisions about the type and level of instructional support in a lesson, it is important to decide where on the processing continuum the instruction falls, whether it is more generative or more supplantive. Let's take a look at the key differences between generative and supplantive instructional strategies in the next slide. In lessons where generative strategies are incorporated, learners are encouraged to construct their own meaning from the instruction by generating their own goals, organizing and sequencing their own learning, elaborating on the new information, and making decisions about which parts of the content to focus on. Essentially, the learner has much more responsibility for what is being learned and how it is being learned. With generative strategies, there is a lower level of scaffolding and learners are more autonomous and free to explore interests in the content. This approach can have a high cognitive demand on working memory and thus is best for learners with extensive prior knowledge and more robust and automated learning strategies. Supplantive strategies are more traditionally used in instruction and supplant more of the information processing for the learner and have a higher level of scaffolding. This strategy is appropriate for learners who have high anxiety about the task, and it conserves working memory capacity by reducing the amount of information structuring. Supplantive strategies are best for less knowledgeable learners or if a limited amount of time is available. Both generative and supplantive strategies facilitate the information processing needed for learning, but the key difference is the amount of scaffolding, support, and prompting provided to the learner to encourage and bolster the active processing of new information. Scaffolding is the cognitive processing support that the instruction provides the learners, allowing them to learn complex ideas that would be beyond their grasp if they depended solely on their own cognitive resources. The designer must create instruction that balances the mental effort needed to facilitate learning with the scaffolding provided to learners in order to avoid overloading working memory. This graphic provides details about the differences between generative and supplantive strategies. Note that in order to decide which way the scale should lean, designers need to consider information about the learner, task, and context gained from the analysis phase of the ADDIE model. This stresses the importance of conducting the analysis phase, which unfortunately is the phase most often skipped. This figure is a summary of the 15 events of instruction described by Smith and Reagan. Note that these events can either be more generative or supplantive. For example, in the first event, students can activate their own attention to the activity or the instructor can gain attention of the learners. When designing lessons, you do not need to stick to either generative or supplantive strategies for the entirety of the lesson. Each event can be placed at a different point along the continuum. 
depending upon your learners, the task, or the context. On the next two slides, you will practice identifying whether an activity is more generative or supplanted. Cognitive load theory is an important theory to consider when designing instruction. It focuses on how constraints on our own working memory help determine what kinds of instruction are effective. Instructional designers need to consider and incorporate strategies that support the management of intrinsic load and reduction of extraneous load. Note that Smith and Reagan refer to extraneous load as incidental processing. The following strategies help to prevent cognitive overload. Offloading refers to moving information from the visual channel to the auditory channel when the visual channel is overburdened. Segmenting breaks the intrinsic load into digestible pieces. Pre-training addresses prerequisites to learning the new information and helps to fill in knowledge gaps some learners may have. Weeding eliminates dead wood or information that may be interesting but ultimately takes attention away from learning important information. Signaling provides advanced cues for how to process material. For example, when we conduct peer reviews in small group, you are given questions to help focus your review and feedback of your peers' draft. Aligning refers to the proximal placement of words and pictures. Eliminating redundancy is the avoidance of simultaneously presenting the same words in text and in narration. Synchronizing refers to presenting related video and audio material in conjunction with one another. And lastly, individualizing is differentiating instruction in order to support learners in meeting the learning goal. On the next slide, you will practice identifying one of these strategies. Prior to the next live session, you will complete the activities listed here. See you then.